it's uh, nice to have you all here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here today. This panel is called Culture Change, Schools, Churches, and the Media. And we have four wonderful guest uh, panelists with us here today. I, because you have their bios in the program, I'm not going to introduce them all in full because you can, you're all capable of reading their bios and you probably know a lot about these folks anyway. So I'm just going to go quickly down the line here and then sort of open up the discussion and we'll have a conversation for a bit and then we'll try to leave ample room for us to have a conversation at the end, okay? Uh, Julie Davis, my dear, dear, dear friend Julie Davis, is the uh, executive director and founder of Face Value, which is a new organization that is devoted to eradicating LGBT stigma. Uh, which just won up a very, very large Ford Foundation grant to uh, fund, partially fund the first phase of the research. Julie is a kind of legendary activist in the movement and has uh, proven herself to be one of the fiercest uh, fighters in the struggle for justice, not only in the LGBT movement, but in the feminist movement and a variety of other social justice contexts, and is just one of my best friends in the whole world. So I'm happy to have you here again. Uh, Herndon Graddock is the senior director now, newly minted senior director, uh, of programs at GLAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. Uh, Herndon and I just became Facebook friends this morning, so it's official. Uh, <laughs> we had one of those great moments where I got on my Blackberry a request from him, which made me realize, oh, I think he must be here. And then I turned and he was on his computer on Facebook, and I went over with my Blackberry and I friended him in front of him. So it was one of these great sort of combinations of virtual friendship and old, you know, organizing methodologies where you actually meet face to face, look each other in the eye, and establish some kind of solidarity. So, uh, Herndon, it's great to have Is you here. Technology in the it's a technology in the Foucauldian sense, exactly, exactly. Uh, Herndon has a, a career in, uh, in media and journalism before coming to GLAD uh, and is now heading up, uh, he's replacing uh, Rashad Robinson who's gone uh, on to uh, be the executive director of Color, the Color of Change. Uh, and Herndon was the deputy director of programs at GLAD before that and has now uh, risen to that new uh, role and very excited about the work ahead of him. Uh, Reverend Irene Monroe, uh, also a dear friend, is uh, is an, an, an every woman. She is a uh, she's a theologian. She is a scholar. Uh, she is a, a Huffington Post blogger. She writes for Pam's House Blend and a whole bunch of other uh, online and print media uh, venues. She's one of the most prolific and profound and prophetic. Uh, public intellectuals that we have in our movement. Uh, Irene, too, is someone who uh, works at the intersection of social justice movements and really has a deep uh, analysis of how uh, we can change this society in all of its many forms. And she's obviously, uh, as, a, as a reverend and a theologian, uh, as a woman of faith, she has been uh, instrumental in, in battling uh, and also uh, re-energizing some faith traditions around uh, issues of uh, gender and sexuality and racism and so forth. And so, Irene, as always, I always call Irene, and she always says yes. And I am so grateful for the fact that you always uh, come to these events, and it's wonderful to have you here again. Uh, and then Arthur Lifkin, uh, most, uh, most especially to me, was my uh, fiance's mentor. Uh, when C my fiance, CJ Crowder, was at the Ed School, uh, Arthur and CJ worked together on LGBT youth initiatives at Cambridge Ridge and Latin. Arthur's taught at the uh, education school, has been a, a path-breaking scholar in issues of uh, sexual minority youth. Uh, he is currently the chair of the Massachusetts GLBT Commission, which was a, uh, a commission that was founded by Governor Weld. Uh, and he's served in that role several times, I believe. Uh, this is my this second, is his second time. Uh, and Arthur's just a, a pioneering educator. Uh, and if there is someone who is going to stand between the bullied and the bullier, uh, Arthur would be first in line and has been for many, many years. Uh, so it's great to have all of you here. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to, to begin the conversation. This is a, a panel on culture change. And I want us to think about culture in three ways today. Thinking about culture as something that has structural components, uh, that there are some structures of power that produce culture, that shape it, that maintain it, and, and possibly change it. Uh, to think about culture as being produced in institutional contexts, and for the purposes of this uh, panel today, we're going to talk about uh, institutional contexts like the church, uh, institutions of faith, schools, uh, and media, or journalism and the media more broadly. Uh, and then so to think about culture through the prism of individuals, how you know, that hearts and minds change that we've talked about so much today. Uh, here in, in this conference so far, and how do we reach, how do we change culture in an individual way, how do we change it in having sort of 
interactions and, and collaborations and, and work across uh, in two, two people or groups of people? How do you change culture institutionally to change these institutions that often are arrayed against us, where uh, the negative uh, images that LGBT people receive and internalize are often produced by those uh, through those institutions? And then what other larger structural forces of change uh, would we need to confront in order to change those stigmas, prejudices, uh, and all the things that we're up against in the broadest possible way? And so I want to sort of just frame it that way, to think about those three dimensions of culture. And to ask each of you uh, for uh, uh, three to five minutes each, and I guess, Julie, we'll just start with you and then go down the line, um, how in your work currently or in the past uh, have you sought to engage in culture change around these issues of stigma or anti-LGBT bias, prejudice, and behavior in the culture? So, Julie. Great. Um, well, I think it really started for me when uh, I started doing work in the political arena in Oregon in uh, 1992. And we had been a state that had been uh, battling uh, anti-gay ballot measures for six years at that point. I mean, it's a history that kind of continues uh, forward today. But we had been a, a, a community that had really kind of garnered all these resources and energies towards campaigns that lit, lasted and existed for them until election day and then collapsed and exploded. And then, you know, our opposition would continue to organize, right? They were sustainable and ongoing. Um, and so I entered the field post, uh, post Prop 9, the first Prop 9 in Oregon in 1992, where we had this campaign, we actually won, but on election night our opposition announced that they were going to go city by city, county by county, and try to pass um, anti-gay ballot measures banning um, non-discrimination ordinances across the state. So they lost, but they were completely energized. Our community was completely devastated and torn apart. So I um, came into my work trying to introduce and gain confidence in the belief that we could do it differently. And so my work uh, started with trying to build what we call then a, a movement campaign, which really integrated the idea of politics um, and political campaigns with the idea of thinking long term and building a, an institution that could be there permanently to both respond to these um, these assaults from our opposition as well as begin to do ongoing education around basic issues like the fact that we didn't have laws that protected us from uh, employment non-discrimination which most of the people in Oregon didn't even understand. So really started um, in my very beginning uh, building of institutions, this idea that we had to marry these things together. Um, I'm glad to say that that, that that campaign, 1994, we actually wrapped in and created the, the first uh, inclusive statewide organization called Basic Rights Oregon, which was still exists today and in fact does that precise kind of work and actually is doing some incredibly innovative uh, work around uh, messaging and education on, on marriage right now in preparation for uh, potentially a proactive ballot measure um, in 2012. So at, at the root, I guess, of, of my understanding of what we had to do, I've always understood that the work required us to both try to um, win the most immediate struggles that we had before us while trying to advance the broader movement and our broader struggle of trying to gain our place within society. Um, most recently, uh, and with a lot of help from my friend here, Tim, uh, I have become the uh, executive director of Face Value, which is an organization that really is focused on how we do this cultural work, how we actually begin to build uh, community communications and community engagement strategies that are really designed to uh, create interventions that actually begin to address the underlying bias, the underlying fear, the under underlying um, stigma that society still holds against us as LGBT people. Um, and quite frankly, we're working to build on all of the great uh, successes we've had in our political and policy struggles, which have, have brought us a long ways in terms of being able to finally hold a place within society. But as we know, um, and as we d discussed throughout the day, bullying still exists, right? Um, that's probably the most profound way that we still see, see stigma being acted out against us um, as a people in society today. But we also know that it exists within our families. I mean, it, 
we all have stories to tell of how we've come out. There's been some semblance of tolerance and kind of the waters have eased, but there's still a great uncomfortability with the idea of us bringing our partner home for the holidays or with the idea of having a, a wedding photo of us equally um, hanging on the wall with our siblings. So we are really looking at how we can begin to change that context of those kinds of attitudes and really help us to move beyond a society where I think we've really reached a point of tolerance. Um, and people will say, you can be here, just don't talk about yourself too much. Um, and how we can move to a society where we become fully integrated parts of our society, in fact, uh, respected, appreciated, and seen for the value of who we are and what we have to contribute in our otherness, quite frankly. Um, so that's the work of face value, and that's uh, what I can do. Great. Thanks, Julie. Arne? Sure. Um, and sort of thinking about what I would say, it's um, kind of hard to sum up the, in three minutes the, the role of media in, in culture change in terms of the work that that we do at GLAD. And, you know, I, I thought that I, I would just kind of tell a story that might sort of tee it up. And I come from Alabama, and um, when I was around 20 years old, I, I left Alabama because there was no way I was closeted, and there's no way I could sort of deal with that there. And um, I moved to LA, and I ended up, I was, I graduated from UCLA. And, um, at the time, I remember thinking the only thing that's going to change those people is Hollywood. Because they're so, you know, and it's like, I was thinking also when we were talking about the hostile countries towards sort of um, LGBT uh, interests that, uh, that we could put Alabama up on that list, too, you know, in one of those colors. Um, because, they're, you know, their society is very rigidly built around, against change on a number of levels, this being one of them. but. Um, Hollywood is something that they're like defenseless to. You know, the kids sit in front of the, the TV and, and, and um, there, there's really um, not a lot that they can do to, to get them in, in the way of that. And, and just as another aside, I end up coming out to my mom a few years later and um, we discussed at the time that she had never been aware of having met an, another besides me, openly gay person in her entire life. And she was uh, living in a town of a half a million people, had grown up in an Episcopal church, and was married to someone who had been, and had engaged in statewide political campaigning for the past sort of 20 years up until that point. So, um, and so in that, you know, so to think about it, many of the people in this country, and I'm sure my mom is no exception given her, given her sort of background, the only people, the, uh, the only openly LGBT people or the first openly LGBT people that many people in this country will meet are on TV. The character on Glee is the first gay person that they'll get to know. Um, the stories that they receive in the media are their only examples other than the ones brought to them by their church or their Sort of the Alabama culture for an example. Um, and so the importance of the stories that the media tells and the, and, and the, the entertainment industry portrays um, are so important because it's, it's really um, setting the stage for the, the, the electoral work that we do and, and sort of giving people a frame of reference of the sort of broad spectrum of who LGBT people are. Um, so at GLAD, you know, that's the sort of passion and perspective I bring to it. There's a lot of different work that we do at GLAD. You know, the entertainment work probably gets the, is, is the most sort of top of mind for people because of, you know, stories about celebrities get picked up in the media, of, you know, you know, exponentially more than, in, to, than the local stories and the, the, even the national news stories we do because people's interest in celebrities is very obviously much more than anything else. Um, but in, so in all of the air, we work in the entertainment industry, we work in the uh, national news space, the lo local and state media, field media, we have a, uh, a religion, faith, and values 
um, director and team, we have sports media advertising. And so broadly, um, what we're doing is we're um, either lobbyists for fair and accurate inclusion of gay and lesbian stories and characters and, and um, so pushing these positive stories so that people receive um, you know, positive ideas about what we are. And then in a much smaller way, much in terms of time, we're, we're really fighting um, stigmatized um, versions of who we are in the media. Those are, tip so it's like this carrot and the stick in, in the entertainment business and in the national news space, we're benefited by the fact that most people want to do the right thing. Um, most people who are producing entertainment or producing news really want to do the right thing, and so it's, you know, getting, having them um, sign on and become allies to what we're doing and figuring out a way that they can do it that makes sense within their business. Um, and then the sort of defamation we work we do often gets a lot of press. And sometimes that's sort of making an example of, an, of, of a non-malicious actor who just doesn't really know the difference between doing something defamatory and doing something not. And sometimes it's that there are malicious actors who um, we have to um, bring consequences for the malicious behavior, whether it be by getting advertisers to drop their program or various other financial um, consequences for for sort of defaming our communities. Um, so I don't know how long I talk, but that's sort of a broadly. Good, good. Irene? Okay. Um, what I do is go around the country. I always thought I had a loud mouth. This is the first time I've told them not to. I always can... like to at least start with the mic, and then okay. you know, we can All just right. start with All right. right, but being a lesbian, I don't feel comfortable with this phallic symbol. You're married. What I, what I do is um, go around the country uh, doing community church-based organizing in, in, in attempts, uh, they're not always successful, but in attempts to destigmatize homophobia and heterosexism in the African American community. And um, then what I do is, is then when I get some data and the church is doing some progress or I see some glimmer of hope, I call that my Jesus moment. Or <laughs> moment. Um, I'll write about it in Bay Windows or, or Huffington Post or whatever blogs that I'm in. But I want to share with you just the data uh, here in terms of African American, Christian African Americans' uh, attitudes around uh, homosexuals. And, to, and I know that many of you know that it's a difficult task. Uh, and it, you know it, but I want to sort of give you some texture to it. Uh, the, difficult t the, the difficulty I'll have is you don't tell a black minister five minutes. It take me about take us about 15 minutes to get warmed up, but that's all right. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna do my best here. But I want to read this data, this data to you. Okay, um, <clears throat> I read this in March of this of uh, last year. This was um, 2010. Uh, African American Princeton's um, Eddie Gowder published an obituary for the black church in the Huffington Post, titled, The Black Church is Dead. Gowdy talked about several of the problems facing the African American community, but nowhere in his piece did he talk about anti-gay ministers and homophobic congregations. So I want to give you a little data, and then I'll talk. According to the Pew Research Center's Forum on Religion, and these two are reading as I'm reading it, <laughs> uh, on religion and public life, 87% of African Americans identify with a religious group, and 79% say that religion is very important in their lives. The Pew Report also showed that since 2008, African American Protestants are less likely than other Protestant groups to believe that LGBTQ people should have equal rights. And since hot button issues like gay adoption and marriage equality have become more prominent, support for LGBT rights among African American Protestants have dipped as low as 40%. A groundbreaking study in July of last year 
came out titled Black Lesbians Matter, examining the unique experiences, perspectives, and priorities of the black, of black lesbian, bisexual, and trans communities. One of the key findings of the survey revealed that there is a pattern of higher suicide rates among black LGBTQ folks. Scholars have primarily associated these higher suicide rates with one's inability to deal with coming out and the black church's stance on homo homosexuality. So the question I ask, and I always ask, why can't we as African American and as an African American community tell the truth about our sexuality? And then the follow-up question has to be, what price do we pay in telling that truth? And then the last question is, what role does the church play in perpetuating not only unsafe sexual behavior, but also demonizing its members in the LGBT community? So I just wanted to give you a little bit about that. So let me tell you why we can't talk about uh, homosexuality in our community. Now, while it's true that we have a number of historical antecedents that, that play into that, and I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, what we're seeing is that how these historical antecedents have played out in a very pernicious and unhealthy way. Homophobia is so rampant in our community that it is now a public health issue. What do I mean by that? Well, this is how the media does not really parse out what's going on in the black community. So when you hear gang violence, it sort of falls under this, this huge rubric that, okay, gang violence and, and don't look at that. But some of the gang violence have a lot to do with, and particularly initiation rights, into a gang is go kill a fag. Now, what happens with that is that a lot of times these black kids are killed. There was, one, there was a big incident in Newark, New Jersey, where these kids were on a bunch, they would always hang together. They were college kids, and they were queer. And um, they, were, they, were, um, they were killed. And the whole community in New, New Jersey was, was, was very alarmed by it, and so was, so was the nation, because these were, quote, good kids. Why, would, why in God's heaven would, would you know, these kids be killed? And the newspaper just put it as gang violence that is just endemic to New, New Jersey. But what happened was is that this gang hanged and were isolated from the larger black young adult uh, uh, community in New York because they were gay. But what made it even more insidious is that their parents didn't speak up. Mm -hmm. They were complicit in it because they'd rather have that their child pass die because of gang violence than to say that it was that yes it was gang violence, but what the cause of it was because they were gay. A lot of parents in the African American community rather say that it was bullying as opposed to say, yes, it is bullying, and, and I'm not to minimize bullying in, of any sort, but that it was homophobic bullying that went on. Um, a lot, we talk about high pregnancy in the African American community. A lot of that high pregnancy, a lot of the STDs have to do with the whole notion of a sort of hyper-black masculinity that is really on the down low. And then you, get, you see it played out with the high tendency of pregnancy, because if you pregnate a girl, if you got the mama baby drama, you can't. You're a real man. You can't possibly, possibly be gay. We we also have here one of the things that don't get reported a lot. Really, is the suicide, the suicide that goes on in the African American community. We had just right here, and we have to begin when we say black community. We have to look at it in a much more nuanced way because now when we we have here today than we had probably even 30 years ago, we had people of African descent who not only come from the Caribbean island, but also come from the motherland. And homophobia plays out very differently in these African countries, as we see in, in Uganda and Kenya, and certainly we see in Jamaica and Haiti. But just, just a couple of years ago, a Haitian kid committed suicide. And, 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 and the problem was, and I felt very impotent, because my Creole is not as good as it should be. Uh, and, 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 and they're Catholic, they're not black church, as we know black church. So in me trying to talk across those very differences, I felt like I failed the young man, no doubt. So, so we have this going on. And the thing that we knew, uh, am I, is my time up? Nope. No, okay. But, uh, <laughs> one thing I, I will definitely never do is to cut off a preacher. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I may ask you for five minutes, okay. but I will never okay. do okay. Thank you so much. One of, the, one of the things that we knew long before the CDC came out, long before it even had a name, 
those of us that were on the ground that were pastoring in these black communities, and I happened at the time to be pastoring in the South Bronx, we knew, we saw our sister friends die of HIV AIDS. Now, a very prominent person in this community who has passed away is Belinda Dunn. But, that, but we knew long before that sister died that the new face, that the face, the prominent face of HIV AIDS is an African American straight sister. So now why can't we talk about, I get back to that question, our sexuality? One of the historical antecedents certainly has, has to do with slavery. And the whole notion that, that the community adopted was this called this politic of silence. But this is what happens is, is that what it was trying to do, in many ways it is now turned on itself. But what it was trying to do was trying to negate the sort of, the iconography of, of, of negative images that we have of black bodies and black sexuality. And so the whole notion was that if we didn't talk about it, then the dominant culture couldn't talk about it too. But what happened with the silence, and if you remember what Audre Lorde says, your silence would not protect you, but what happened with the silence is that we lost language to identify and to give voice to what black sexuality is. I go so far to say that because of, of years and decades of silence, we no longer know, black or white, what black sexuality is and can't language it. So that's one of the problems they have. So, and then that silence takes morphs into so many things. See, that politic of silence is now morphed in what we call the down low. That politic of silence is morphed into that kind of homophobia that we hear preached on the, ch you know, every Sunday uh, from 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 most churches here. So, um, let me just say what an approach. And, and as I say, Jane Brown said, "I'll hit it and quit." Okay, I'm gonna hit it and quit. I promise you. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. What are one of the things that we might very well do here, okay? Because the black church is very central. I've always argued that we need to decentralize the black church, and they say, I bring you crazy, okay? But I really do think it would be helpful if we could do that. But that's not going to happen in my lifetime. So one of the things that we have realized is that the black church is, 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 is sort of, unfortunately, the, the backbone of the black community. But, but what, what keeps that black church going is very much the same population of people that kept the civil rights movement, and that's black women. Black women are the, was definitely the backbone of the civil rights movement, and they're still today the backbone of the black church. So what, what, so what, thing, what, what remedy can we begin to look at? I, one of the things I try to do, because I really can't get rid of the kind of, of, of uh, homophobia and heterosexism that is coming from black males. One of the things I've learned is that is although we have black queer alternative churches, what we moved from was what I would describe as uh, heterosexual patriarchy to homosexual patriarchy. So we maintain that kind of androcentrism that, that, that we very much need to get rid of. But what, what we're trying, what, one of the things we have to do here is destigmatize um, homophobia to black mothers. Because one thing black mothers will do, they don't want any child, their child or anybody else's child to be killed, to be bullied, to be harassed. So once we can get black mothers on board on this issue, the, and, and then we got, a, we got a new church. Because <laughs> even if the pastor thinks this way, or is this way, as we've learned with Bishop Eddie Long, this is an amen moment, folks, who got caught, okay, with his almost pants down. But nonetheless, one of the things that we realized that if in reaching black mothers, that would be the most holistic approach that we can get. Because no, no mother, no mother wants harm to their child. I know I've been over, but I'm All so right. sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, Arthur. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Um, yeah, I want to talk about black mothers too, but I'll wait till later. <laughs> okay. Um, I uh, come to this work having grown up in Cambridge in a, a working class neighborhood with a semi professional dad and going to the public schools, and I was a Jewish kid um, in a distinct tiny minority, you know, people who keep fretting over the latest census uh, and um, speculation about the numbers of queer people that there are, you know, oh my God, we're not 10%, we're going to lose our legitimacy because of that. And I keep thinking, well, Jews are 2%. <laughs> and, you know, we can still uh, fight anti-Semitism, and we can still persuade people that, it, that it's an abomination, that, you know, anti-Semitism. So I'll settle for 2%, whatever it is. It's not in the numbers. But, um, so I grew up as a Jewish kid, and, and I felt 
in the schools that I was kind of, I was respected but patronized, you know. It was totally Christian hegemony and Christian holidays and all of that. And every once in a while I could bring in my little Jewish thing for a particular holiday and shake it and show it off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of the great yeah. palm, no. the, palm. the lula, yeah. Yeah, or, or the dreidel, right. uh, or yeah, the, the noisemaker, right. And then um, as, I, as I got older and, um, and the, I went back to teach, I mean, I just within a year, within months of leaving Harvard College, I was back at Cambridge High and Latin School uh, teaching, and Vietnam War was raging, and uh, racial issues were coming up in the school. We, we literally had uh, riots and tactical police coming into the school to break up fights. So um, in my defense of kids who were pr protesting the war, and in my trying to be the perfect intermediary between black and white antagonists in the school, not only was I the Jew, or one of the few Jews on the faculty, I was also a commie and a nigger lover. And believe me, they told me that to my face. Um, I, I was primed uh, for queer rights work. <laughs> because when I finally was able to acknowledge my sexuality to myself, I was ready to be a, a queer activist. And I'm you know, proud to say I was the first openly gay public school teacher in Massachusetts. And have a little... That's not supposed to be an applause line, but I'll take it. They, they, they did a feature in the Mass Teachers Association magazine, and they had my picture. And I just remember being so disappointed, because I thought, I'm never going to find a boyfriend with that picture. <laughs> Looking back at that picture today, I think, God, I didn't look bad. <laughs> That's how it goes. Um, one of the most, one, but before I came out though, one of the most transformative educational experiences I had actually was um, at the Harvard Ed School, where in 1975-76, um, I began to collaborate with Lawrence Kohlberg, who was the developmental psychologist who um, worked in the area of moral development, moral education, civic education. Um, and the program, the, the little school within a school, part of, part of the school day, it wasn't really a separate school, um, but a little program it was called the Cluster School, and I got involved with it and some other communist uh, nigger-loving teachers, and, uh, and a few Jews, and a few wonderful Catholics. Um, and uh, Kohlberg's justice framework really appear, appealed to me, um, and um, we, we encouraged the students in the program to govern, to self-govern. And one of the first issues that came before us after kids voted that if they didn't have class last period, they should go home, which was a disaster. We had to revisit that. And, you know, uh, guide, guide the moral discussion a little bit, uh, hopefully with peers who could make arguments that were, um, that were persuasive. But one of the first things that came up was how some of the kids of color, African American students at that time, in this little program felt uh, as a very tiny minority. And it resulted in an affirmative action uh, program that we took to recruit more kids of color into this program. It was a very, very seminal moment in the beginning of this school. So um, what I guess what I want to say uh, before getting into particulars, answering some of Tim's questions that he, he emailed to me at 8.30 this morning <laughs> when I was already sitting here drinking coffee and eating a scone, telling me what he was going to ask us today. Before we get to that, I'll just say that... Um, Duly um, reprimanded teacher. Everybody's, you know, people are referencing bully laws. They're getting a lot of play in the media, as well they should, and and the bull and the school and the school bullying regulations, and uh, as well as being the chair of the um, uh, Mass Commission on GLBT Youth, which is no longer the Governor's Commission, by the way. It's a independent um, agency of the Commonwealth, it's not a government, uh, governor appointed thing, um, is that I'm also on the board of Mass Equality. I'm happy to recognize my 
wonderful colleague and new dynamic leader of Mass Equality, Kara Suffredini, from whom you'll be hearing later in the day. And one of the things that we are working on is um, how to uh, tra transform school cultures so that uh, <coughs> bullying is um, controlled not only by threats of punishment, which would be, you know, Kohlberg stage one or stage two, but actually the idea of some community, a communitarian idea of fairness and justice. And that means really transforming the culture, the values that the kids are bringing with them to the, to the school environment, and which is influenced by uh, all of the things that folks have alluded to here, church and family, media, and political culture. So uh, I'm all for attacking it through um, preventive um, uh, means rather than just going after bullies and punishing them. Good, good. Now I wanted to <clears throat> shift the conversation a bit. Thank you for those initial thoughts. I very much appreciate it. I wanted to uh, sort of focus attention on the kind of institutional mechanisms that the media, that, that churches, that schools, even families, um, use in order to shape perceptions about LGBT people or how, how these institutions actually shape or constrain uh, the way that we think about ourselves, the kinds of messages that we receive, the way that the culture sort of shapes the, the, how we kind of emote and, and, and what our psychologies are. If you could talk a little bit about the institutions that you know most readily, maybe Julie you want to talk about family perhaps and, and kind of media and, 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 and uh, Irene, the church, and Arthur, the school, and really, you, 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 you have to limit yourself to that. But to talk about specific things that you see going on in these institutions that are sending messages, either positive or negative, uh, to individuals and, and LGBT people more broadly that we're fighting against, because it's that cultural kind of inculcation that gets, that, that first gets transmitted in these institutions that we're really trying to fight against in this larger struggle for equality. So, Maybe, Arthur, I'll, I'll start with you and come back. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, um, in schools, I would divide the, the issue into two classes, invisibility and visibility. Um, how are we invisible? Well, um, kids are afraid to come out, so there isn't a lot of peer visibility. Uh, teachers may be afraid to come out. So there isn't necessarily adult um, visibility. Uh, the student and teacher ethos around coming out, I think, is tremendously influenced by issues of race and class and what people have to lose in coming out in terms of their supports in school and outside of school. Um, and then lastly, uh, invisibility in the curriculum which is supposed to be the main business of the school, is you know, uh, transmitting this, this body of, of truth and knowledge to kids. And it, um, you know, in most cases, uh, textbooks are terrible. Every study of textbooks, even college textbooks, <coughs> shows that inclusion of GLBT history um, is uh, minimal, if at all. Um, I have to say as a footnote that uh, some folks are campaigning for, and in fact even in the California law that was just passed by the California Senate, that there be positive portrayals of GLBT people in the school curriculum. Well, I'm all for positive portrayals, but having grown up with a book uh, given me before my bar mitzvah called They Were All Jews, which talked about all these wonderful role models from Moses to Maimonides to <laughs> Einstein, right? Uh, I don't want to have a curriculum that's all about uh, wonderful role models. I want a curriculum that tells the truth. So I want Roy Cohn to be there too. Mm -hmm. You know, I want the villains and I want an exploration of why they were so screwed up and why they may have even done harm to their own, um, their own people, so to speak. Um, uh, you know, Tony Kushner's done a pretty good job of pointing that out, and I think we could read some sections of Angels in America for that in an English class. Um, so yes, representation in the curriculum. And then, what, what about the visible uh, presence? Um, 
Yes, we do have some gay-straight alliances. In Massachusetts, we have a lot of them. Uh, but who goes to them? And more importantly, who doesn't go to them? How are they perceived within the school? Um, we have some out teachers, uh, and, uh, and, we, and we have some inclusion in curriculum. But I would say mostly uh, queer visibility in schools is um, around victimhood primarily in the rules about student behavior, harassment, and bullying. So we are a class of victims. And secondly, in the one part of the curriculum where we sometimes get included, health, we are repositories of disease and hugely at risk for HIV and AIDS and so forth. So that, that is, you know, that's a medicalized model, very, very problematic. Oh, I go next? Okay. Yeah. Um, you you want to know what would be what is one of the institutional problems? That you yeah, what are the institutional mechanisms? Mechanisms that, that, that place. Okay. All right. Um, one of the things we find out in the African American Church is that it, it operates as a multiple site. And so, what do I mean by that? I mean that it's just not the place where you go for worship, but it's also the place where you get education. It's also a political place where you you know you go and hear about politics. Um, Civil rights movement birthed itself very much in, in, the, in that place here. So one of the things that that tends that tends to continue to get reinscribed erroneously, uh, and we we continue to bicker whether we're black queers or white queers, is this whole notion of black civil rights versus gay rights here. And and then of course someone like me who who lives the intersection of both, you're asking me to make this sort of uh, crazy. Uh, uh, distinction here. Uh, am I am I more for gay rights versus black rights? And uh, it sort of like it reminds me of what black women had to do. I think in the 70s during the um, the feminist movement, they had to ask themselves, or the question was raised. It's not that they asked themselves because you don't. I don't get up in any given day and divide myself. <laughs> <laughs> As they say, I get up with all this fabulousness. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, which is the great oppression being being black or, or being female. The thing here that we have operating here again uh, in black communities, as I was reading my piece, is that they they we do, it's, when I say we, not me, but the, the, a lot, most of the African American community do not see do not see gay rights as a civil right. And what happens? There are two reasons why that happens. One, the media has a lot to do with that. The way in which they have just reported civil rights in this country long before the civil rights, the gay rights movement came on board. I mean, you, 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 when we understood civil rights, we we only understood it. We all, it was only reported. Okay, it, it's almost the the, the I iconic image is that if you're talking about civil rights, it belongs to black people and nobody else. And so you, you you're operating with that. But you're operating with a couple of other things here uh, it, within the community, within the gay community. So then you got, why do many, so many black LGBT folks don't bother? Because indeed it is a civil rights. One of the things that you learn that the difference in historical experiences of oppression does not negate it being called a civil rights movement. All right? So I'm not saying that the difference I, I'm not saying that, yes, the difference of my ancestors being enslaved uh, is any more oppressive than the kind of oppression that gays are experiencing. And what I am saying, that it is a civil rights, but it's a difference of experiences. But the issue here that operates here is very much have to do and falls very much within the dominant LGBT movement. The point is, is that if you, if, if what happens is, is that when you bleach out history, or you, re you revise it, then the very thing you need down the road is not there because you have erased it. So let me give you an example here. Why does this persist? Persist, and then it gets no help because the church looks at this too. When we look at Stonewall, Stonewall was a, was a black and Latino working class bar in New York City. It got raided certainly, just as the other gay bars did back in the day. But it got raided more because it didn't have the kind of money to pay under the table. So, but what happened? What happened that night when you had these black, you know, trans communities, you know, out there? And it was so interesting because they were saying, where's the trans? Well, listen, not only were the trans out there, because these were black and Latino trans, you had black LGBT people whipping a whole lot of ass, or attempting to anyway. 
back in, in 1969. But the, but the history got bleached, okay? That it got bleached and then reinscribed to be a white queer movement. So then what happens is, is that you don't get even the help you want within, in the queer community because then you use us, meaning people of color, for a photo op movement for an agenda that you have shaped and a story that you've lied about. So what happens is here is that you've got now this, this, this internal problem of that the, the, the history is right there and then there's no effort to correct it. And then you're saying, well, how, what's happening here? Well, you know, what, what they see, what black church people who are not gay, this is what they see. I've heard one parishioner say, well, you know, and since 1969 to 2003, and, and I'm talking about here in Massachusetts when we got marriage equality, they said more has happened, happened in those 40 years for LGBT folks thinking that they're all white than has happened for black people for the 150 years that we have, you know, at plus years we've been enslaved. So what happens is that we're, and, and we're pitted against each other. That's number one. Proposition 8 is a good example up here. I mean, it's not only wrong-hearted, but wrong-headed to put our, put our right on a ballot. Clearly, we knew that if we, you wouldn't do that for blacks today, although I do think back in the day they would have done that for blacks. I mean, let, I mean let's be real about that. But, the, but, but what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that there's that problem. And then when we talk about misappropriating of history, what we do here, and I swear I'm going I'm to hit it and quit again. Okay? <laughs> what, we, what, what we do here then is that we take iconic black images like Emmett Till, Rosa Parks, MLK, you know, all these people, and then slap it onto the LGBT movement as opposed to use the images that are iconic to our history, like Matthew Shepard. Like Hester Rita. Who's Hester Rita? A black trans that got killed in Brighton back in the day when I first got here in 1998. So what happens is, is that the, 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 I call it the rampantness of white privilege, not doing the work it needs to do within its community. It misses these grand opportunities to, ha to, to have the kind of prophetic movement that it is, simply because one thing is true. Where this black civil rights movement, we can say, was monolithic, the, this movement is prophetic because no, no matter where you go in the world, no matter what class, no matter what race, shape, or whatever, there's at least one gay person. <laughs> so, um, uh, I encounter lots of ways in which stigma um, is perpetuated in the media. I, I want to talk about, about a few of those ways um, in sort of different um, media areas. Um, in the entertainment industry, I, I, um, there are sort of small issues of defamation. Um, there, I think a bigger issue is that um, as our images evolve, um, it kind of, it, it follows sort of the, the idea of, of gay people that sort of people in Hollywood are comfortable with, which is, um, you know, we do this thing called the NRI where we track quantitatively the LGBT images and sort of the top 10 networks and then the broadcast networks. And, and so we also track them by uh, race and gender. And the, the image that Hollywood is comfortable with as borne out by the data is a white upper middle class gay man. Um, and, and there are a number of problems with that, but. It, a big problem with that is that it gives people across America and around the world the impression that the that gay people are um, sort of not suffering the um, type of discrimination and sort of hardships that many gay people face. Most gay people are not Will from Will and Grace, who sort of doesn't seem to have any issues with sex or, or, or sex. Um, <laughs> and, um, and sort of, so when when the public goes to vote on our issues, they think, well, they don't need anything. They, you know, they've got, yeah, I don't think they're, they're they've got a BMW. You know, um, they don't need the protections that marriage affords because their lives are much easier than the sort of well, the many issues that we have to face doing carpool and making the bills, and, you know, making ends meet. And so. Um, I'd say people in Hollywood are really allies, but it's a case of where um, the road to hell is paved in good intentions. And so our, um, a lot of our work is trying to, to lobby the, the entertainment community to really paint 
us as a part of a, a clean a true fabric of, of who we are and, and, and what we are so that people um, can have a, um, a realistic sort of um, empathy for all of our experiences. So I, I'd say that as far as the entertainment business, the news business, um, which I, I, my background is in both. Um, the news business has this problem with false balance where they create this um, uh, black and white world um, where you're either one thing or you're the other. And, and thinking about it in, in, um, in religious terms, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Lisa Ling did this um, show on OWN recently that we spent, I can't tell you how many hours I spent dealing on the phone with Lisa herself and sort of like trying to get her to understand why in spite of the fact that what she thinks what she did was really good, the reality isn't, it, it's not about how Lisa perceives it because the, the show essentially showed like Exodus people and then sort of pro, uh, sort of affirming uh, people, LGBT people of faith in an affirming way and her contention was the Exodus people look so depressed, they look awful, you know, like, look how unhappy they are. You know, this one kid named Christian, he was a drug addict, and now he he got rid of all of his art, he's living in this sort of, like, manner, he's not expressing himself, and he just looks unhappy. And what I was trying to get her to understand is, to people from Alabama, who start out with this thing that to be gay is just so awful, they would choose Christian's unhappiness That's over right. Herndon's oh, yeah, fully happy gay life. Because to be, and, and it's not about, Lisa, your perspective. And it's about that it looks like that it's an option to sort of de-gayify yourself and, you know, live this sort of celibate condition. It's very hard sometimes to get people who are our allies to understand um, that it's not about their New York or LA mentality around these issues. And so, like Lisa and Owen asking the question, can you pray the gay away? And that was the title of the show. She thinks that's a the ridiculous <laughs> rhetorical question. She really does. And she thinks her show showed about how ridiculous it is, but it, it sort of doesn't own that a big part of the country does not think that's a ridiculous question millions of dollars are sort of spent on these deprogramming camps and that to sort of there's a reason why she was given full access to their to bring her cameras in and they're not fools but um it's hard to sometimes get our allies to get on board with sort of the bigger the bigger picture thinking so and and then i would say another issue you know the sort of the false balance thing is, you know, we could talk about it for a really long time, but to in the in the um, also in the sort of people of faith um, piece, the number of times where uh, so Wolf Blitzer has a show where he's going to talk about gay issues, and he thinks, well, okay, like on the um, don't ask, don't tell. Well, I'm going to get an expert um, who's going to be in support of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and I'm, I need to get an expert who's saying, even though the public, it's 80% in sort of the favor of the repeal, he's still got to think it's got to be 50-50 in the presentation on CNN, because otherwise they're going to be called biased, which is for news people, to be called incompetent should be their biggest fear, but their biggest fear is to be called um, biased. <laughs> Um, but who they end up booking, Fox doesn't worry about it, and look how effective they are with their audience. And look at their ratings, because, you know, anyway, we could go down that. Uh, uh, the people who they book to, to be an anti-LGBT voice are almost always people who call themselves <coughs> religious, and it's, it's almost, fr almost always framed in that way. And the people who are pro-LGBT are almost always framed as secular. So it creates this narrative where to be um, pro-LGBT means that you're secular. And to, and to be of faith means that either you're anti-LGBT or you're not in line with your faith. That sort of 
false duality is not reflective of the actual scenario in, in the U.S. where there's a lot of churches, the Lutheran Church, for instance, that has moved completely towards um, full inclusion, full participation, they, they call it, of both gay parishioners and clergy. So, but CNN, and sort of there are a number of, you know, the Episcopal Church has done so on a national level and sort of on a, on a local level it's a little different, but there's a, there's a, yes, the, um, the, uh, the news is telling one story, and the cu the culture is caught up, is moved forward of this new this thinking in the news, and so part of our job, my job at Glad, and something that we're trying to do is not only sort of sort of point out this imbalance between you know the number of pro or sort of voices of faith you you say are anti LGBT or you say are of faith or whatever, and sort of to force them to take that same um, fear of bias and make them look people who are uh, um, pro-LGBT voices of faith, since they're not gonna, they're not gonna be giving up this sort of bias fear anytime soon, and there's probably nothing GLAD can do about that, because it's just, um, it is what it is, but, so, using the sort of realism around that to force them to um, book pro-LGBT voices of faith, it sort of changed that narrative, and then the other piece of it is, um, forcing them to reconsider who is an expert. Mm. Just because Peter Sprigg doesn't like gay people does not make him an expert on, on military <laughs> readiness. <coughs> you know, people who should talk about as an expert on nuclear or military readiness should actually have some military experience. It's not just people who have an opinion and have an organization behind their name. So anyway, those are a couple of the, the ways that... Thank you. Um, families, uh, I think Irene uh, nailed it earlier when she Know, any mother wants their child to be safe. And so I think that um, our families um, often respond to uh, us coming out to them in that our life is going to be harder, our life is going to be more difficult. Um, so that, that whole narrative of, of struggle in their life is, is not going to be as good. And I think that we see that both in presented in our families where we come out, and then we see it in this fear of parents who are concerned about children being taught about LGBT and then being exposed to the idea that it's okay to be LGBT and that means that their lives are going to be harder. So it's, it's a cultural perception of family and a cu cultural perception of what our lives will be like that gets perpetuated uh, with our parents. Um, silence, I think, is another thing that families kind of uh, reinforce in, in this idea that we can't tell people about it. What will they think? Um, that it's a negative reflection on perhaps our parents or the whole idea of what this family that we came from um, meant. And so it's, it's a bad reflection of their parenting skills and what they taught us and the kinds of people that we are. Um, so I think it really perpetuates that idea. Um, and I think that it also perpetuates this idea of tolerance. Um, you know, we all live within the context of uh, uh, our biological families, and many of us, I think, if we choose to go back or, or be a part of it, um, experience a certain way of um, being recognized but not being fully appreciated and accepted for who we are. So, it, you know, things that I cited earlier, the idea that representations of our relationships are not equally held um, with our siblings. If they've been married, you know, we don't hold the same kind of places as that family or creature wall with those, those images up there. Um, you know, we often can't bring, or if we do bring home our partner, there's conflict around that and it creates conflict. Um, and so I think that, you know, our, our families are a reflection of what the broader society reflects, right? Um, in terms of, it's okay to be gay just as long as you don't have to talk about it or promote it. I was, I was going to ask a question about interventions, specific interventions that we can make in these institutions to, to, to change them, to sort of affect some kind of change in the culture. And feel free to sort of address that as we move forward with this last question before we open it up. But it occurred to me in the, in the conversation here that there's this representational challenge with respect to culture change. Right, it's all of you on some level have talked about the, the, the negative images or the positive images that people have 
available to them with respect to LGBT people, and whether they're, they, you know, in what ways are they shaped? What in what representations do we have? What when we hear gay or LGBT or lesbian or trans, what do we think of, right? And the, the culture shapes what we think of when we think about. It. But I'm also wondering that, that, that one of the things that I think is essential to any kind of culture change, any kind of any kind of change regardless of whether or not it's in the broader realm of culture or politics or what have you, is this question of empathy, of, of, the, of a felt connection to another human being based on some sense that the experience you're having is shared or can be shared, right? And then I think that, that at the basis or the foundation of equality is the capacity to construct opportunities for empathy, that you can't have equality without it. And one of the things that strikes me about the sort of the moment we live in now is that more often than not, the negative representation, or representation of something that is happening that's negative to us, right, bullying, hate crimes, David Cato, Matthew Shepard, right, people who are murdered, bullied, attacked physically, done violence to, is often the moment where it moves, it's a tipping point, or it moves the dial in terms of people's felt connection to us. That it's not the representation of our love, it's not the representation of our physical connection with one another, if we kiss our partners, right? Certainly is not the sort of the, the very human practice of having sex, which is, I think, a very positive thing. Obviously, not everybody does. But it often is not those positive, which is why Will can't have sex, I think, right? right? Will can't have sex in order to be loved like Will, Unwilling Grace, was for as long as that show was on, in my opinion. Um, but it's the negative representations of something that has happened to us that is negative, often violent, that somehow triggers in people an empathy for us or a connection to us or a feeling that is positive towards us <coughs> that they wouldn't have with all of these other positive associations that we're actually creating for ourselves. So how do you change the culture if the thing that makes people feel closest to us is the very harm that is done to us in a culture that hates us. I guess I would challenge whether that stirs empathy. Okay, I, okay fine, that's fine. I mean, I think that what that stirs in people is the, the idea that we need to be protected from certain things, right? But it still doesn't mean that they want to identify with us. I actually think that that narrative of, of violence reinforces the idea that our lives are going to be harder. That in fact, that there's a whole society that, that hates us and that, that, we're, that it's going to be dangerous for us to be out there, and so therefore, it's certainly something they don't want for their children, right? right. So I think that um, I don't want my kid to become that right. right, right. So you know, I'm going to do everything I can to try to keep you from becoming gay, right? As if they can control it. Um, so I think that 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 construct and the empathy leads to then the the reinforcement of part of what our own strategy is is that we need to give protection to. LGBT people vis-a-vis -vis the laws, vis-a-vis -vis policies, which still continues to keep us as an abstraction and as an idea, not as something as an that, issue. that an issue as opposed to real people with real lives that, uh, that we in fact share certain things in common with them and then there are things about us that are unique and different. And I think that you know we haven't gotten to a place where we can where we have really designed long-term strategies that are community-based. I mean, I think we've done it with TV and we've done it in entertainment, but we haven't really done it in community-based ways that actually bring us into connection with and colliding with those people um, who we really need to be affected in terms of long-term. Yeah. And I think that in the schools that means that, you know, GLBT people are not only victims that are portrayed in youth risk behavior survey literature because that's the strategy we've been using for 15 or 20 years to get money out of the legislature. You know, our kids are at greater risk for all these things. Well, in fact, they are at greater risk on a number of, you know, drug use, a uh, number of sexual partners feeling depressed suicidality and you know attempted suicide all of these indicators our kids are disproportionately at risk and talk about erasure of part of the story within the GLB and they don't include T even though we've been fighting for it for a number of years to have gender identity and expression included in the uh, CDC 
um, youth risk behavior survey that's administered here uh, every two years in the state of Massachusetts and elsewhere. Uh, but the GLB cohort has a disparity within it that the kids of color are at greater risk of many, if not all, of these risk behaviors than the white GLB kids. So we've been used to getting people's sympathy yeah. as a means of getting money to help our kids who are most at risk. And that doesn't acknowledge that even though our kids are disproportionately at risk, the huge majority of our kids are not at risk. And so it's only lately that people have been beginning to look at the issue of protective factors in the research on GLBT youth. In the past, it was all about the risks. Now they're beginning to say, well, what are the things that we can foster that will allow these kids to thrive, allow more of these kids to thrive? Um, and what you've just said, I think, is, is the key. And I think, you know, my work as a teacher in high school was that bringing young people together in mutual endeavor so that they get to know one another in the course of doing work, of doing projects, not just sitting there and saying, it's gay day, so I'm going to talk about my gay mother, or it's black day, so we're going to talk about, you know, <laughs> what Strom Thurmond's uh, biracial child, or whatever the issue is of the day, but beginning to really respect one another as human beings, and as human beings with a rich and sometimes intersectional history of, you know, race and faith and sexual orientation and ethnic background and all these things that we supposedly celebrate in our um, patchwork nation. Um, I kind of, I see examples where we do sympathize with, with sort of gay people. Uh, you know, I mean, I look at Glee and Modern Family and why they're able to do what they do and, and um, and how they're able to do what they do. And, you know, I mean, I think what's interesting is, like, the third rail is um, when our images make, uh, to me, the third rail is when our images sort of force um, straight men to have to reevaluate the rigidity of their sort of sexual identity. And, um, and so, like, young kids having a sort of romance is, is one thing, and it's sort of divorced from adult male straight sexuality and sort of um, married with kids um, because sex doesn't occur in that dynamic, you know, um, people and people are comfortable like, you know, it's about a different something. You know, I look at like, and I think we may have discussed this briefly at another time, but like the prevalence of bisexual bi bisexuality in men in other countries and sort of the complete absence of it here and that you know, our country is uncomfortable thinking about sex in general. And it's not just gay sex, but like, if for a straight man to have to think about like, well, you know, he's gonna have sex, and what, you know, what would I think about, would I like that, would I like, what do I, you know, like, they just, you know, and so it forces this wall, and so, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, it's like a war of attrition around those things, and I don't think that we're gonna be able to change that um, cultural aspect of America immediately, but there are ways to tell stories about LGBT people that people can empathize with and people, but we just, to, to shift gears and have them think about that person that they already empathize with and have love for and feeling for, and suddenly they're having, you know, it, and so it's a, it's a careful dance to, and I think it's one reason why marriage has been an issue that like, I think is being accepted more quickly than other gay issues and you know it's like you know it's there's a because marriage in America isn't about sex it's about <laughs> commitment you know and it's about a many many other things but the the first thing that people think of and it's yeah and it's like um, it's had a you know and she was mentioning sort of black black sexuality and, and sort of neutering of, of the imagery around that in order for white people to feel comfortable. And I think that in a way, like, that's sort of where we're making, you know, inroads on on sort of the statutory acceptance of, of uh, gay people. Um, because 
marriage is sort of neutering of gay sexuality. And, and then the other thing I would just say, there's a temptation to think of, of our statutory success and sort of we got marriage and in, in, in sort of this state, we got marriage, which are all really great. But we, you know, I often think like institutional racism did not stop with the Civil Rights uh, Act in the 60s. It in fact lived on long and well and sort of for us to have statutory or for African Americans to have statutory rights around civil rights did not actually mean that they had civil rights. And so um, I think it's important as a movement for us to acknowledge that just when, when, and, when and if, when marriage happens in all 50 states will not mean that we have gotten all of the rights that we're looking for. It means that it'll be on the books and if, you know, we just kind of think historically, that's a lot more work after that. You know, it's not, it's a great starting place and it's a great place to like get a, you know, a foothold, but it's not the end. I think that as an institution, the military actually illustrates the dangers of the post-rights period. Because in my estimation, the, the reason that military wanted to create the fiction that there were no gay people present during the time when gays were excluded from the military, it really was about unit cohesion. And I think those who, who those military leaders who worried about a threat to unit cohesion if gays were allowed to be in the military really had a point. Namely that the kind of intense bonding, the kind of intense male 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 friendship that is encouraged and needed uh, in the military has to be done in a fictional absence of homosexual potential. Yeah. Once that is gotten rid of, then you're going to have problems creating the kind of bonding that you want without everyone screaming, oh, no homo. I really love you, man. I'll throw myself on that grenade for you, man, but no homo. What about, yeah. what about climbing the greased um, obelisk? In, in, have you seen that? And in, in the Navy has this whole, it's actually called the Herndon something, which is why I know it. <laughs> and it's like they grease something that looks like the Washington oh, yeah, yeah. Monument, and then they all climb up it, you know, as a like bonding, you know, it's like oh, there's sure. so I mean, much, there are athletic you know, teams that, oh, yeah, that yeah, do yeah, quote yeah. unquote yeah. teabagging, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, that subject. That's where I first learned. Men who subject one man. another to <laughs> overt sexual acts yeah. as a. As a, as a rite of passage, a means of initiation into the group. And it's all to be laughed at, and, so, and that sort of purges the homosexual potential so that the team, I think, in my opinion, I'm no expert on sports, maybe <laughs> Jeff will speak to this, um, but, but I think it, 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 it permits the kind of bonding on a team that you want because it is so homophobic that it you know, banishes the idea that gays could then be present. Yeah. So I'm saying in the military, there might be a problem with the bond, with the bonding that they want and need, and also there may be an increase in homophobic incidents yeah. um, because there's no longer the presumption that they're not sure, there. Right, right, right. Now, I don't want to cut off the conversation about sex because Lord knows we need more of those, but um, you can certainly talk about sex. But I am, I want you to have the last word before we open Oh, okay. Uh, okay, if you want to skip me, it's okay. No, 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 no. Well, I, I have a different approach. One of the things that you learn as, as a minister is that uh, if you change the heart of people, that's an amen moment. But if you can change the behavior of people, uh, then you've done something. You can say you've earned your, your, you've earned your, your, your few dollars for a, for a day. So one of the things that I think is important in terms of when we talk about what can be done and, and types of intervention here is that, um, we, and again, I mean, we would like to move people to empathy, uh, but I'll take a little sympathy if it's going to change your behavior. King said this, which I thought was always important. He says, you know, I can't make white people love me, but if a white man hits me, he will know that, that, there's th that, that because of, you know, hate crimes on the book, because there's legislation on the book, that if you put your hand on me, that, that you're going to jail. And so the, the most that we can do here with, within, within the black church, and this is where you need um, black mothers, is that if, the, if, the, if, the, if our MO is that we don't want to cause any harm, I don't care, I'm going to be very quite honest with you, I don't care if the pastor is homophobic or not. What I'm asking is that you don't spew that venom from the pulpit. 
So if nothing else, I've changed your behavior. Now over time, with change behavior, there might be a change of heart. But if it doesn't happen, I'm all right with that, as long as you're not doing any harm. But another thing in terms of intervention, particularly when we talk about the church, and it's not only particular to the black church, but I think to most Christian churches, I think that we have been on the down low and in the closet when it comes to those texts of terror that we don't speak about those texts. And the church is that place, the very place where we can get a new rendering, a better understanding of it, and a better, and really a move away from making them have the kind of voltage that they have in our Christian discourse. So, so if, if there's two things I would offer is that, we, that you spew no harm from, from the pulpit, that you get at least in the black church, black mothers behind it, and that those texts of terror, we do something about those. Okay. Amen. Uh, okay, we have 25 minutes for Q&A and for your questions and uh, to our panelists. And what I'll ask is that you ask a question. Uh, I ask that it be a question that is uh, not uh, 25 minutes. And <laughs> I ask that you identify yourself and speak up so that we can get it on the video recording. So who wants to open up the question? Don't be shy. Yes. Um, my name is Julia Jacobson. I'm a student at the Ed School right now. Um, and Julia, you mentioned something about uh, the need for more conversation with people who really are against, um, like fully against gay rights. And I was, something about how we need to, those are the people that we really need to be um, engaging with and that we're not. Is that something that? Okay, something something I interpreted. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you've seen that in action, like if you've really seen meaningful conversations, because um, it seems to me that the dialogue is more um, like what you described, um, the fair and balanced, where um, it's this false dichotomy. And I was wondering if there, if you've seen any examples of either in the media or in communities of people coming together who do have divergent views but are able to have meaningful conversations? Um, I, I didn't witness them, but in Oregon there were folks who did that strategy, given that we were in this constant uh, battle of um, ballot initiatives. So there were folks who actually uh, did a mediation type approach of community organizing where they tried to get people together from both sides to start to have conversations. So I mean, people do use conflict resolution kind of models to try to have those conversations. I haven't seen them on large scale. Um, but I mean, you may. No, I have that on watch Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Rotman. I'm an MPA student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I, I guess the, I'll focus it towards you, Irene, but it's really open to the whole panel. So I was in California when Prop 8 passed, mm -hmm. and one of the immediate reactions to that was a lot of venom from the gay community towards the African American community and their vote on Prop 8. And there was this idea that black voters, specifically church-going black voters, were a major reason why Prop 8 ended up passing. And, and we found out later that that just actually wasn't true at all, um, that the numbers were 58% of voters who were black did vote for Prop 8, but 53% of Latinos did, 49% of Asians did, and it was really based on age. Um, the older you were, the more likely it was. But my question is, is where did you think um, or any of the panelists were kind of some of that good or reaction came from why is there just this this bitter frustration uh, that exists in the gay community that that there's this almost like this desire where it feels like these two minority groups should be together on a civil rights cause but it seems like because there's this idea whether it's maybe through hip-hop music or maybe because I really don't know maybe President Obama not supporting gay marriage there's almost this frustration that the African community American community isn't as a whole it seems like standing up for gay rights and I was wondering I'm not saying that's true, I'm saying that seems to be the perception. And I was wondering, do you think that that might have been the cause for the reaction? I, I, I think there are a couple of things for the reaction. Number one is that, um, as we remember that, Obama was on the ballot. And so, so people couldn't conceive of it being split like that. It brought out the most black popula population across the country than ever. And so, 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 so the um, California gay community felt like they had this in the bag. Uh, the, the problem with that, and I remember when my girlfriend called me from California, and she says, you know, they're blaming black people for, for, you know, the passing of that bill. And I said, well, my goodness, when did California become a black state? You know, <laughs> considering that overall it is only 6.2 per, 
percent of the population. So there are a couple of things that, that, that was definitely operating here. California d d didn't do, d you know, it's very, very interesting. California is a whole different, are, are you in California, honey? Uh, no, I, I'm, well, I've been in California, but okay. I live in New York. All right, well, any, anyway, Julia, okay, that's another, that's another country in and of itself to me, <laughs> in many ways, especially the North and South. Um, they should, they, that should be a split, but nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless here. <laughs> But, 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 but nonetheless, there are a couple of things that, that was operating here. California really felt, and it, it was really, a lot of it was hubris. They felt like, number one, we got, we got money and we got stars. And one of the things that it didn't do, it didn't canvas those African American communities. It did not have black people that, from the community to help them do the work that, that certainly needed to be done. But the other thing that it misses here is that African Americans as a whole, particularly Christian African Americans, and, 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 and we're seeing less of that even though there's a, a generational divide, are conservative. They voted conservatively like the Mormons did who financed it, like the Catholics did, like everybody, Episcopal, right, like everybody else. But this is the problem, this is where what we don't look at how racism rubs and continues to rub us, meaning LGBT folks and black people. That whenever you want to pathologize something, it's very, very easy to put it on a black shoulder. And so the point is that, yes, homophobia is in the black community. But you know what? So too it is in the white community. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it, and so it's, it's, it's almost as if we bear the burden of Prop 8 when, when, when the burden should be on the organizers who did not, <laughs> since, since so many of us were coming out to vote for Obama, did not think it needed to go into Oakland, all those little black areas, and canvas and find black LGBT, because see, we don't have the option, like many uh, white queers do, of living in a ghetto. We have to live in a queer ghetto. We have to live in our ghetto and, and wrestle with space there. But it refused to call the very people that could have helped them to at least do this much, at least talk about it from the point of that, as I say, behavior change. Not trying to, not trying to change the heart of folks, just behavior change. Imagine, and it would have worked. Imagine if it said, just think about it, that this was, was put out to the black community. If your civil rights was on the ballot, think where we would be today. And that's why I said it was wrong-headed and wrong-hearted to do so. I, mean, I worked on the Prop 8 campaign um, late in the game, but I, I think there were several things. One, there was no strategy with communities of color at all. So, I mean, well, one, have, no. so, I mean it, it was universal. Um, I think that where that piece started, right, was exit polling, and it started with the media saying that um, African Americans voted in larger proportions for it than against it. But it obviously hit a nerve that's a natural place for us to go. Right. But it was it was it was a media a, a media and exit polling strategy that you know people were trying to drum up a conversation about. It. I don't know. Um, but that's where they went with it, and the media actually drove that, and obviously it sparked um, a nerve and, and, and was inflamed. Um, final thing is that re religiosity actually was a very high predictor, mm -hmm. right? But that doesn't make African American people any more uh, highly have a higher propensity to vote for it than it did um, white folk. And as as you forgot to point out, 50, you know, we 52 percent of the vote. So I mean, at least 52 percent of white people voted for it. So I mean, there was not a disproportionate shift among any any population that voted. Just, just to add, and I don't want to make it too long. I, I think that's that's the point that I was trying to make. I realize that when you look back at the polling, you realize that that blame should never have been placed on African American right. community. But what I found interesting was the fact that it, it did hit such a nerve. Well, I, I want to just one quick thing to, to speak to that. One of the things that I found, I do think it hits a nerve. And one of the things that's very interesting, we've been doing a lot of like research into public opinion polling, and then also this sort of thinking about these kind of cultural perceptions and how they operate and so forth. One of the things I think is so fascinating is there is, I think, a perception among um, you know, the, the, the perception that the LGBT community is all upwardly mobile and white and male and has a BMW and so forth and, is, and, and doesn't care about uh, racial justice issues, doesn't care about socioeconomic justice issues and so forth, when in fact the public opinion polling shows that there's lots more variation within the LGBT community, even within the white LGBT community, and that LGBT people are actually more progressive than any other category, subgroup of people around a whole range of justice issues, racial justice, socioeconomic justice, and so forth, that we're actually more liberal and more progressive than any other kind of slice of the nation when you do kind of those demographic sort of 
breakdowns. And the other thing that's really interesting, and GLAD has done this research recently, where they did a whole bunch of, 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 of opinion polling within the African American community about messaging and a whole range of, 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 of LGBT issues. And one of the things that was found in that study, which I love, is that the African American community, uh, and I'm not trying to the African American LGBT community, obviously, but broadly defined, is much more progressive on a whole range of LGBT issues, with the exception of marriage, than any other slice of the population when you break it down demographically. And so the public opinion research that we now have suggests that actually that white LGBTs are actually much more progressive on racial justice issues and socioeconomic justice issues, and that black folks are actually more progressive on LGBT issues, with the exception of marriage in some cases. And yet, so we have that data which actually completely undermines the very perceptions that are so sort of firmly held to. And what we need to do is we need to start to unpack that. And the other thing that we need to do is we need more folks who will live their lives at the intersection of those very communities. I remember when, we were, when my partner and I were in Tudor, I was in DC, he was in Brooklyn. We called each other that night, we were both crying, we were thrilled, and so forth and so on. Obviously upset about what happened in Prop 8, he's from California originally. And I remember as the week went on, He's African American and gay, obviously. He's not marrying me. I hope he's gay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, we'll ask him later on. And one of the things that he said as the week went on and the blame game started, he said to me, Where am I in this debate? Where do I exist in this conversation? And I remember being really moved by that and thinking, Yeah, like put him out there. Not that he would ever want to do this because he's like, I want to be a public figure. But, like, Let's listen to folks who live at the intersection of those very communities, and that's going to collapse these, so that I think, these barriers of distinction that are really misperceptions that we cling to that prevent us from making the cultural transformation that we all so desperately need for some kind of common liberation project. Hi. Um, should I try to videotape myself? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, we'll just hear your disembodied voice. <laughs> so I, I asked a, set, a question similar to this in the first panel. I don't want to recapitulate, but I'm kind of taking it in a slightly different direction, which is, um, Jeff and I talked about this, this afterwards a little bit, is that the, the danger of, a, of I mean, the, the dichotomy of creating a group also kind of captures it, makes it an object for scorn, and prevents connection. I was thinking this in, the, in regards to, and so the, the segue is into what role can human rights, because this is, after all, human rights as, as gay rights or vice versa, be a way out of this. The, the reason, the particular example is that as a straight identified male, I think, it's, I think it's important to speak about how most straight identified males, myself included, have been attracted to men. It's insane in that people aren't attracted to attractive people for whatever reason. But I almost risk saying that because I wonder if it's more powerful as coded as a straight identified man to not admit that publicly because then I just become a potentially closeted uh, gay person who is just try is just um, might be exposed as that. So in other words, we're talking about that LGBT community, what it means to be gay, and it doesn't admit the spectrum of sexual desire and expression that a lot of people experience on a day-to-day -day level. It normalizes um, what it means to be gay or, or lesbian, what these, these phrases even mean, especially because they're not ascriptive identities. Um, you can't tell by looking, usually. Now, you could respond by saying, well, we don't have the luxury to endorse a wide range of, of sexual expression. We need to fight these other battles to be recognized as, as humans first. However, it is really dangerous to say, I'm gay, as if that, that means something that then can't change. You then start to have to identify with what it means to so quote unquote be gay, when that might not be where you would more naturally gravitate if we had more freedom. So to come all the way around, what are some of the other idioms that can get out of this aporia where we're, we're trapped within an identity that circumscribes limits and does a certain amount of violence to, to everyone by, by, you know, if you label me, you negate me. I, I made I Irene Lee, I guess. Question. And in fact, one of my favorite hobby horses for doing queer work in schools is that talking about these issues gives kids who are not gay um, within the very narrow confines of the definitions that society imposes on us opportunities to talk about their own sexuality and how it doesn't necessarily conform to the norms and expectations and I even have a little bit of testimony and it's just 
one class that I remember helping a long time ago at Cambridge uh, Range in Latin. It was a psychobiology class talking about nature versus nurture and the social construction of identity. And one of the kids said at the end, well, I'm a straight male, but having the kinds of discussions we gave helped me to understand myself more as a, quote, straight male than other any other conversation I've had in the school. So I would hope that um, the kinds of exploration of sexuality that we, we would be doing with younger people um, would almost discourage the need to create these mm -hmm. dichotomous or what was the word you used? Poor something or other? Aporia. That's a new one to me. <laughs> what is aporia? Aporia is like an undecidable situation. Oh. The clusterfuck is my father. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a working class version. Well, that may be, that may be, that may be, in this case, aporia is euphoria. Because you don't need, you know, you don't need to label. I am who I am. My sexuality is this. It doesn't need labels. And there are more and more college-age students who are saying that these mm -hmm. days. You know, there's a whole no labels, I think, campaign. And part of it is this. Um, you know, labels, while originally liberating, are now a means of oppressing not only those that take them on, but everybody else who doesn't, which I think is the point of your question. And just, there's a new student group at, at Harvard, actually, a new undergraduate group that's called Glow, Gay, Lesbian, or whatever. Uh, that is, that is, it's, it's a group that was started by queer students of color who felt that they were not quite sort of well positioned in the other groups. It's a very interesting thing. I'm Jeff Parati, and uh, I just want to assure him that, uh, that I assured Elliot that the more straight men who are open and talk about being attracted to men, the better we'll be. So, um, I was going to say, that, I think that, Elliot that, that, like lead a movement. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I don't, you have to stop using words like a whore. I mean, let me just tell you that um, say, Elliot was like, uh, you know, a star athlete here at Harvard, set the record for most number of assists in basketball, had quite a reputation. And, and I, work, I worked with schools the last 20 years, and I worked specifically with sports, but uh, more in general around LGBT is, issues. And I think that it is a lot about gender and helping people to get out of the traditional gender box. And when you think about the unique role that certain male athletes play in setting the school climate in schools, helping to promote um, conversations and openness like that really does make a difference. And and when I think about, so thank you, Elliot, for that. I mean, and that's uh, rarer than it should be, and I think it's important for us to shine a light on the bright spots when it's happening to show people that it's possible. So thanks. I also think that, um, I mean, I really appreciate this fabulous panel and think that it was, when, when it's so tempting to talk about negatives and the problems and the barriers and the negative messages, this, there was generally a really positive, hopeful tone about what is possible from Julie beginning saying that the work of face value uh, rests on the successes that have happened, from you know Irene talking about the glimmers of Hope and Belinda Dunn, who certainly was an example of that, Arthur talking about protective factors, and, and then Herndon talking about we were benefited by the fact that most people want to do the right thing. I mean, I love that because I've been doing this work in schools now for 20 years, and that is over and over my experience. And that is what I think we really need to focus on and where that happens. And when we think about empathy, I mean, when we do trainings in schools, we always talk about context, empathy, facts, skill building, action. And empathy is number one about thinking about how that happens. And, and the number one way we do that is by encouraging storytelling and working people to tell their own narratives and really spending time helping people to, from inside the school system, make the connection. One of the first questions we'll ask is, how many people here have an LGBT person in your immediate friend, family member, or are yourself? They raise their hands and then we say, without violating anyone's confidentiality, who feels comfortable sharing something? Well, then it's like, so teachers have been there for years. My son's gay, and when he came out, he had a hard time in high school, whatever. Those stories are right there. We also have them on the, on the panels, the insiders. That's developing empathy. Especially, we get the young people in the schools who are comfortable and supported enough to share their stories. And if we have one question to ask them to talk about, it's whom would you like to thank in the audience right now who's made a difference in your life 
in supporting you around these issues. It's not like any negative stuff gets glossed over, because it's like, I want to thank Ms. O'Neill, who said that she doesn't allow anti-gay comments, because, you know what, I got, when I got beat up, I felt like I had somebody to go to, and she was there for me. You're creating, it's like, oh, these are what the norms are in the school, that people are here doing things. When you talk about that, um, you know, lack of parental support and kids getting bullied, there's a connection between the two. And somebody had asked a question earlier about any um, communication that happens with people who are in a different place. Caitlin Ryan at San Francisco State and the Family Acceptance Project met with parents who were rejecting and found that when parents realized they were hurting their kids, they moved. And the hopeful part of her research is that parents didn't have to go from A to Z. They just had to be a little bit less rejecting and a little bit more accepting in order to see more than 50% of benefit in, you know, in, in mental health outcomes. And the last thing I just want to say is that around the media, the most effective tool that we've used as a media um, a device in our trainings, whether we have a half an hour or a longer, is a 15-minute segment that was done by Anderson Cooper um, from ABC 2020 on Corey Johnson, who's right here in Massachusetts. He was co-captain of his football team. He came out and he got a lot of support from his teammates, yeah. his coaches, his parents. And it's a real success story, again, about most people wanting to do the right thing and about support happening in unexpected places and happening in arenas where, because of all the bonding among males, it's assumed that it doesn't happen. So it completely, even young women approached Corey at the school when that happened and said, you know what, your coming out made it better for us here because if the football captain can be gay, and the team could rally around you, a lot is possible around outside the traditional gender box. You can't tell that story without the Lady Gaga part. <laughs> exactly. Now when I show it, I, w I was telling Herden that um, now when I show that, I I'm really glad to have, um, in addition to that 15-minute clip, a three-minute clip from the March on Washington last year where Corey interviewed Lady Gaga. So, <laughs> um, so students love that. But it's definitely around empathy, and it's a, it's, it's, it, it captures what, um, what needs to happen because his mom's in, his parents are interviewed, his coaches are, his teammates. But there's a lot of good happening, and I think that's just my final point, is that really we need to be asking the questions, what's working and what's already out there, because there's a lot of good stuff that's happening. And that's what inspires people to do more. It's interesting that our discussion has moved in the direction of the third level of culture that Tim had outlined, the individual person-to-person -person, uh, discussion, what Kenji last night referred to as micro-interactions with yeah. people. Uh, there are a lot of people who want to do the right thing, but often don't know how to do it at the person-to-person -person level. One of the things I often hear from people is, I'm in the situation with someone making an offensive remark whether it be gay or otherwise, but often around gay, and I didn't know what to say. It is possible through schools or uh, preachers or the media to model or suggest scripted or semi-scripted approaches to those kinds of situations. I wonder whether that is happening. It is, but I think too often it re revolves around um, you've done something bad, and we're going. You may be punished if you do it again. In schools, when some teachers uh, interfere in in homophobic bullying or name calling, kids learn those are the classes where I won't get away with it. But those other teachers don't say anything, so I can do it there. <coughs> or I can do it in the cafeteria because no one's listening, or on the playing field. I think the most effective intervention for that, what do you say when someone says bad, is you, because knowing where most pre-adolescents and adolescents are in their development, is to say, what <coughs> you just said to so-and-so hurts me deeply. And then explain why you are hurt. If you're a straight ally, if you say, my cousin is gay, and when you say those kinds of things, you're insulting a person that I really love, and I just really get upset by that. Or if you're gay yourself, and you can come out about it, fine. Or someone in your family, immediate family. But I think modeling the, the empathy, 
the, the fact that you can feel hurt on behalf of someone else and that you can create a community around sensitivity to people being um, victimized with that kind of language, I think is really, really helpful. Much more helpful than, don't do that, you're going to be kept after school, you're going to have to write, I'm not a fag bait, or on the blackboard a hundred times. And that's central to every training. To answer your question, yeah. yes. But, Those scripted answers and trainings are happening. But can I, can I just being a, a part of a very macho basketball culture my whole life, it's just not realistic that kids are going to be able to do that. I mean, at least at the start. I think, like, the way I handled it was just say, dude, don't do that. I mean, yeah. and that may be kind of policey, but just the fact that I was saying those kinds of things, I think was a lot better than trying to go through a speech act that in that scenario would be completely, I, don't, I think it would be, I would be, I would lose, the, maybe even lose the power that I had. I was making assumptions about this. I thought that this was a teacher-student. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought this was kid to kid. I, no, I'm sorry. I think it's a very different If there's a peer to peer to peer thing at that point. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I misinterpreted it. Yeah. But I think there are a lot of different ways of being able to respond. And a discussion about what they would yeah. be would be an interesting panel yeah. in itself. And then how to move those. Yes. To the creatures and right. the and it's interesting because there are strategies for like political talking points, right? Like ways to respond and having political conversations when you're doing political organizing and campaigns and so forth with how to set a cultural version of that. And they're in um, schools too. And there's in yeah, schools right. we have it too. Yeah, exactly. And we ask in school, we say, How many of you respond when you hear that's so gay? And hands go up and we say, What do you say? Well, what are the pros and cons of that? What do you say? What do you say? Immediately, the norm in the room is that they see that a lot of teachers respond in a lot of different ways, and they immediately get language. So that's yeah. definitely is sensitive. Is that what taught in business schools? <laughs> I, I can't even get the gem in the business school. I don't know what's being taught in business school. <laughs> <laughs> Last question here. Did you hand up? I, I, I just wondered if I could make a quick recommendation sure. to, to, to follow on from that. There's a local author, uh, lives in JP, called Jan Donnelly, who in the summer published uh, a novel for youth and adults. It's called The Side Door, um, about two friends, um, male and female, coming out as gay and lesbian in high school. Um, one of the best things about it is, is that the female character will not be shamed. There is nothing that happens to that kid that is going to shame her. It's a beautiful story. The author, um, I'm a Unitarian Universalist, um, I invited the author out to speak at our church. She's a wonderful speaker. She's great on a panel. Look her up. Invite her. Um, but this is a story that is very good for uh, kids, youth, adults to read. Um, and it, 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 it's it's full. It's rich of many themes that um, that, that you can really grab on. To. Uh, could I ask one very quick sure, question? Sure. In your opinion. Um, how afraid do we have to be, and what is the best way of currently organizing against the right of the right? Well, that's a quick question. Yes. Well, in 25 seconds, let me tell you. Well, should I answer that? Or no? Sure. Okay, I'll hold that. Um, well, one of the things that I think is really important is that you know there are a lot of different theories about sort of where the right is. Are they resurgent? Are they on the wane? Is the Tea Party sort of the, this last gasp of a dying sort of you know white conservatism, uh, et cetera? And I think that, that those questions are actually really important, and we need to sort of think about this. One of the things that I think is is really scary to me. Um, the, uh, after Prop 8, I was contacted by, after the 2008 election, I was contacted by an elder in the Mormon church who wanted to come to Cambridge to interview me. Uh, and I was so okay, fine. And uh, it turns out that he had also contacted Peter Gomes and, and John Page, who was the undergraduate chaplain at Harvard, and a couple of my other colleagues who were out and visible sort of LGBT folks in the community. And one of the things that was happening was uh, it was basically a, a kind of listening tour where the Mormon Church, the Department of Public Affairs, after Prop 8, had, and the movie came out, and the, you know, all the, the, was the documentary film, uh, Prop 8, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and he just wanted to know what I, and by virtue of me, we feel about them. And we had about a two-hour conversation where he asked me a whole series of questions about the stigmas that we have towards Mormons. As, and was very upfront with me that they were that they had placed an enormous amount of resources, both in the financial, around a kind of destigmatization tour, 
a project that would become part of the public affairs you know, wing of the Mormon Church um, in the wake of Prop 8. I, I, I share that, not as a sort of, oh my god, it's, it was a very interesting conversation. It was an actually a substantive conversation. Um, and, you know, you asked the question about, you know, can you come to the table and have a conversation? But one of the things that to terrify me, it, it made me feel good at first while we were having it, because I really felt that we did have a, a conversation where we achieved some common ground and were respectful of one another, and that had never happened for me before in that context. And then he left, and I really, and then I found out that he had been sort of going on this sort of listening tour of queers in Cambridge. And I was terrified because of what, it, what I realized was they're trying to remake themselves, right? They're trying to remake their image in the wake of a, of, of a very negative, heated kind of an episode, battle in the culture war, uh, and they're, they're reconstituting, right? And, and for me, that was a sort of terrifying moment because I, I think there is, a, there is a one narrative to say that, we're, that, that the kind of right is on the wane, that there's this last gasp and all the kind of radical right stuff that you see, all these manifestations are actually just the sign of a kind of dying you know, carcass. Um, and I, I, I think it's very dangerous to do that. I also think that this narrative of progress that I think, I, I love Jeff's joy. And I love the fact that Jeff brings a joy to this work because I think that that's important. Martin Luther King understood the only way that you're going to triumph over hate is to is, is to is to meet it with love, right? And we, we know that that acts of civil disobedience that way are that way. You, you resist war with peace, and I think that's really important to understand. But the other thing that I think is really important to understand is that we are often being out organized because we are asleep at the wheel. And I think that the narrative of progress that we are weaving, that it just gets better, right, is a teleology over a cliff, right? It's not a, it's not a, it's not a movement towards liberation. It's a movement towards, towards a, a crisis moment. And that if we just think that until the old, when the old homophobes all die out as they take their last gasp of breath, and we think we're we're on the win, we're on the on the rise. I think we're going to be caught in a very bad situation where we realize that the folks that we can't see anymore have actually been away reconstituting themselves, refortifying themselves, reorganizing themselves, refashioning themselves in a kind of gentler image that is actually going to be much more difficult to fight in this culture. We're not to not to put a buzzkill on the joy, but I think that we have to be joyous while we pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So uh, with that, if I could take the moderator's privilege to have the last word, it's been a very rich conversation with four incredible folks.